Hello and welcome to episode 416 of the Crate and Crowbar. It is the 24th of April 2023 and joining me tonight is me, Chris Thurston, and also <laughs> joining me tonight is Marsh Davies. Hello, that's me, not you. I fucked that up real bad. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to lie, Marsh, I thought about saying, why don't we start this recording again? We're only 37 seconds in. I think you've styled it out. Did I? You've, you've pulled it back, yeah. Your, your sheer panache <sighs> has rescued it. Wow. It's like I only do four of these a year or something. <laughs> Incredible. Uh... Well, uh, it's, nice to, it's nice to hear your voice again. Uh, it's nice to be back. Hi, Marsh. Congratulations, hey, I should say, Marsh, on the success of your, your teeth. Thank you. My teeth are looking well enameled, 404% enameled at the time of recording. That's exciting. Uh, this is the role-playing game that I uh, egregiously plugged in uh, a standalone episode. Sorry about that. I did feel well, bad doing that, but at the same time, um, I like money and um, I want it. Are you feeling Are you feeling sated by this level of success or do your hunger is ever for more? Will you ever be satisfied? I will never be satisfied, Chris. Um mm. No, it's it's been incredibly gratifying. I mean, it's less about the 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 numbers. It's really the reception of it that has been pleasing. Like it's it's nice to have something I've made finally out there in the world, and people are looking at it and saying nice things about it. And that hasn't happened for a long time. So it's good. It's good to have something. Absolutely. Well, I think uh, yeah, I'm I'm just very pleased. I'm looking forward to seeing it in person. Having heard you know obviously so much over the last couple of years, and yeah. What a nice thing. It's always nice to see a friend doing well. Thanks, man. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was fucking awesome, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Shall we talk about roaming around a big fathomless ocean hoping to find something of value? Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I have been playing, as I believe you have also, uh, a game called Dredge. Mm, a game Ooh. about fishing and oceanic or perhaps celestial terror yeah it's like an open world kind of quite cute cartoon fishing game um with a a sort of top-down aspect you're you're trawling around doing other fishing verbs crabbing potting pottering netting uh hauling up fish playing a bit of fish inventory tetris taking them back to port selling them upgrading your boat and so on but all of this is layered on top of a kind of uh spooky cosmic horror mystery with uh big big ocean willy energy <laughs> you know oh yes real ocean william if you know what i'm saying <laughs> he's out there <laughs> he's out there he's out there and on a lonely night perhaps you will see him in the distance or what you think is him but is it is it or is it simply a mirage a a consequence of your own deteriorating sanity as Ocean William draws ever closer. These are the questions <laughs> raised by Dredge. How are you finding it? Uh, yeah, you know, I've struggled. Oh, sorry, actually, somebody's knocking at my front door. I've got to go. And there he is. Ocean William has arrived. Claimed another victim. And it falls to me to conduct the rest of this podcast by myself. I've done this on one prior occasion when I was much more practiced in the art, if I'm being honest. And I don't really have much to tell you, friend, other than I hope Marsh returns and returns soon. When? When will my husband return from the war? He said, staring out to the ocean. My my husband, Ocean William, I guess, in this bit that I'm still doing. Just talking to myself. Hmm. So, uh, Dredge. It's pretty good. I've played, uh, don't tell Marsh this, I've played about two hours and 13 minutes of it. I don't know why it's important that you don't tell Marsh that. In hindsight, I don't think you judge me for that. Certainly, we've talked at length on about games that we've played for far less uh, time on this podcast while forming entirely um, specious opinions. But in this case, I feel like I am barely both scratching its surface. Maybe I've discovered all of its depth. I don't know yet because I don't know how deep it is or how broad its surface might be. I can hear him in the distance, perhaps returning. And I don't know if that is truly... Uh, that he has arrived or not. I mean, the person at the door, what it could be, it's mid-afternoon for Marsh right now. It could be the Amazon man um, with his latest reserve of whatever 
filthy magazine he's into at the moment, God knows, or just a, a big pack of crayons. Um, or it could be, I don't know, uh, a, a neighbor uh, in need of help. They shan't have any, not from Marsh, I'll tell you that. I used to live with the man, a frightful time of my life. Uh, but this podcast, I suppose, benefited from a time where we could uh, simply wander from uh, into one room, set of a microphone or two, and talk total bollocks um, for a great couple of hours. It's funny, isn't it? Thinking all the way back to 2014, just dredging that up, to, you know, segue back to the game uh, from the mists of time, thinking about who we were back then. Uh, I don't know if I've told the story on the podcast before, but Marsh would sometimes draw little goblins with their dicks out and hide them around the house for me. I'm sure I've told that story before. But I was thinking about that fondly the other day, uh, fondly for about 15 seconds, and then back to just sort of wondering what it will feel like when I start to understand any aspect of my life. I really hope Marsh comes back soon. Anyway, Dredge, yeah. Um, it's a fishing game. It's pretty good. I like the little mini games you play. Probably I'll say that to Marsh as well in a minute. There's something nice and sort of pleasant about the repetitive action of fishing in any given game, I think. And it's interesting why fishing is such an attractor for that sort of gameplay. In fact, it can be pleasant to just press a button on a prompt on, you know, like golf games. Golf games have a similar thing, I suppose, and golf and fishing are an equivalent arm movement. So maybe the fact that it's our, are they? I don't do either. But I'm going to say that with a relative certainty, knowing that no one can judge me for saying otherwise. Was that Marsh coming back? Hello, Marsh is back. <laughs> Hello. Is it going to be hard for me to isolate the silence? There is no silence, Marsh. I just oh, talked God. for about six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't six minutes. It was closer to four, I think, but it well, felt like six. That will be a little treat for me later. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, a man wanted to come and fix our door at an inconvenient time. Hang on. So hang on. Back up. Your door was broken. Um. Yes. Uh, on, uh, on what did he knock? Uh, the door the door functions in terms of knocking. It doesn't function in terms of sealing is the problem. Oh, I see. So why did he need to knock? Why couldn't he just burst on in? <laughs> he's he's not the size of a centipede, <laughs> would be the answer. What, they, what? they have free ingress, but uh, human-sized uh, oh, I see. don't uh, have what? a little bit more difficulty. How is it that every place you live in has its own like unique new vermin i know it's it's my particular allure i think i was i was just telling the void about dredge um <laughs> if you'd like to pick that up oh yeah um what was the question you asked me it's what i thought of it right <laughs> yeah <that's, that's, laughs> uh, you asked how you thought about it and then you left um but um presumably you like it a little bit more than that or not yeah i, I was struggling to work out how, what i felt about it really because in some ways i find like the like the central rigmarole of it I don't like actually, and yet the kind of the jest out of it I find quite appealing. I don't know. I I, I feel like a game about fishing should have a more interesting central fishing activity, whereas mm. it's a really boring rhythm action mini game in this. And like I, I was comparing it to other games where there is there they create. Um, there's a lot of delayed gratification in in dredge in that it seems to fall into the current trend of game design, or at least convention where there is an upgrade system which paces your journey through this otherwise open environment uh i don't I don't object to that in any way but I, I feel like if you create all of this space which is going to be filled with like a repetitive central activity then that's repetitive central activity needs to be itself very gratifying I didn't find it fun at all, mm. but then I do quite like everything around it <laughs> to, to quite a high degree. You know, I, I, th I think that the, sh the way the world has been described and the the threat of nighttime, the way that that is enacted, just the idea of time itself, the way that that works in the game, I think is really interesting. Mm. I'm sorry, I burped at the same time <laughs> saying that. <laughs> 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 But you know what rises from the deep well, <laughs> <laughs> just bubbled up and out of me. Um so yeah, like <laughs> so when nighttime falls, you are prone to going slightly mad, the the fog rolls in, there's all this kind of groaning and splashing in the dark as you putter desperately for home. You could be attacked by certain things at the at night. So it gives you like a time limit during the day, you know, in which to achieve your activities in relative mm. safety. Um 
And the way that that works is that time stops when you aren't moving. And so it, the time limit also ties to your boat speed and thus the distance you can travel. Um, and if you perform a task like fishing, it advances time. But otherwise, if you just stop dead in the water, you can spend all the time you like mucking around in your inventory, uh, planning, looking at maps, and so on. Um, and I think, I think this is this. I think this is true. Maybe you'll know. Um, but I think if you get more powerful engines, that means that time advances slower when you are moving. So it allows you to move those greater distances without the game actually having to model like a ludicrous differential between your starting ship's speed and an upgraded one. Hmm. I'm not sure I'd noticed that, that exactly, but I now have a significantly faster ship than I did when I started playing the game. And I have noticed that I get a lot more done in yeah. a given span of time. So A day seems yeah. to last much longer the further mm. you are, you're into the game. And I think that's a really clever and neat way um i also think it's interesting that time doesn't apply to fish <laughs> like, famously like if a big bad fish is coming for you it doesn't care that you are still it doesn't care that you're not technically advancing time um you just have to get out of there um and that kind of feels right given the kind of celestial horror aspect like it's it's a fish beyond time and space. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Like, I think, so I've only, I, I confessed to this while you were gone, but um, I have, I've played maybe like two and a bit hours of it, two hours and three minutes or whatever it is I said earlier is probably still true because I haven't played any since, you know, then, obviously. Um, and I am, I know exactly what you mean in that I'm starting to, I actually, for what it's worth, quite like the rote activities of fishing. Um I uh, might be compelled in another timeline to go off on one about whether or not little very simple rhythm games are kind of just a fun activity in and of themselves. I agree with you that it's not as compelling as it could be, but I do mm. find that little orbit of go mash button, find thing, go back, spend, sell thing, find special thing, you know, upgrade, you know, meander through tech tree, upgrading things is sort of like basically satisfying to me you know what i mean it's a sort of yeah but it's it's basically satisfying right. i think it's not much more than that and i think uh i mean I, I i agree with you that 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 kind of sustained me for the first couple of hours because i'm still learning about the world and stuff but then the more that that was asked of me the less into it i was i think over time mm. there's, a, there's another can i just go on another yeah. weird little tangent about the time the way that time yeah yeah so there's another system that doesn't abide by the time rules and it kind of works in the opposite direction of the way the simulation's intended so you get this i'm um, i don't know i can't remember exactly how it started it's like a nitro boost or something it speeds up your boat when you press a button Sure. Um, but it threatens to overheat, so you know, this mm. little bar fills up with heat, and so you can and you know, you'll damage your ship if you let it go. So you can only use it in these short bursts, which is fine. It kind of adds this kind of little kind of mechanical frisson to long journeys. But um, but weirdly, its cooldown exists in real player time, not in in game time. Mm. So <laughs> to explain the effect of that is that uh, in order to be maximally efficient and do as much as you can in the time of day that you have within the game, you have to burn this afterburner, whatever it is, then stop dead uh, to stop in-game time and wait for the cooldown to occur in real time. So what the, the end is that you create this really odd cadence to travel where you're, you're kind of going as fast as you can, then you're stopping for like 10 seconds, <laughs> completely still, uh, and then starting again. Huh. Um, which, I mean, I'm... You know, I'm sure that's not the fantasy they had in mind. And I know I should just resist that and simply pootle along regardless of how efficient it is in, in terms of advancing game time. But you know how it is. Like if there's a tiny mechanical incentive for me to completely ruin my own experience, then I will absolutely do that. Right. Yeah, I think I think I, I so I hadn't that hadn't occurred to me. Like I hardly use that ability. Um, I use it for when there is a pedal. But oh, not really? at other times yeah not a, i mean i don't find it very much more efficient to just go because boat go fast anyway hmm. um but i have found that even in that first couple of hours, so you know i kind of the nature of the sort of one thing i like about it it has this sort of you know until you get to the kind of the night time and some of the spookier stuff and the eerie writing and, and and so on it sort of unfolds that aspect of itself quite slowly 
you know and i, I think I, I really like it i like the art i like the, i really like the sound design actually particularly um, mm. the way it indicates like the potential presence of things at night and i like the way it kind of introduces new ui elements or other things to kind of unsettle you and i'm still excited to see more of that happen but i do think that i, I do agree with you that i think there is a a slight tension between the game at its various levels as a horror game. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit. And when you start talking about seeking mechanical advantage and things, um, that comes into it for me. So, so one thing that I have kind of determined is, you know, one thing I like about it, for example, like I think, I think you could make exactly this game much more look much less pleasant to play by introducing things like i don't know fuel or upkeep for the boat there is sort of upkeep for the boat in terms of taking damage and needing to fish to re- buy repairs and stuff but most of the time you're not for example sinking your resources into upkeep costs which is a common you know it's a common way to burn your time in any sort of you know crafting game basically mm. uh, which is functionally what this is um it doesn't really do that. Almost all of your, in, in a quite a positive sense, almost everything you do is kind of making your life easier one way or another. And then that is sort of exists in tension with the fact that many of the things you're doing are spooky or are kind of like of questionable impact on you. You know, like the, you know, even the, the that nitro boost power is, you know, the, the, one of the reasons you shouldn't burn it is it increases your panic because it is sort of otherworldly in some way and so on. And you know, there is this sort of um, tension that the game is being held in between you making these, like, the the positive fun of a fishing game, like the acquisitive, you know, the acquisitive crafting, kind of building out your boat, improving your boat, and so on. And little things like the satisfaction of inventory Tetris and doing that well, you know, of kind of planning the layout of the upgrades on your boat versus fair, um, spare space for fish. There's a whole game in that, right? And it's a very common kind of experience. Um, and I think the novelty of Dredge is the way that that's married to a horror experience. Um, in the same way that um, something like um, Inscription grows out from being a card game, right, into something else. I don't think this goes quite that far um, in, in terms of becoming something else. But there is a point where you're playing a fishing game and something closer to like a sort of open world investigation slash survival horror game but you're a trawler right this is not to kind of you know um that's not to sort of um you know uh spoil anything really Uh, i think that's a fair assessment and what i found where i'm getting to like i've you know i'm I'm, I'm past the first area now and then into different sort of location and so on is that um I'm compelled by the narrative and I'm compelled by the locations. I love an ocean mystery. I love an ocean willy, as has been as has been um, said many times in this podcast. And I think you know, there's I, I, I want to unpick a bit more of its mythos. I want to find out what's going on and so on. Um, but I, I've now found that my rhythm of playing the game has changed quite a bit from fish and in the course of fishing, find something strange, investigate that, back to fishing, upgrade the boat to try and do the thing I think I want to do in the environment um, and maybe get some fish on the way. Um, but mostly like uh, do that until the point where I kind of need to maybe stock up on some money for repairs or new upgrades and things like that. Then mm. back to fishing for that purpose. And then back to almost being drawn into like brute forcing some of those encounters or sort of little set piece environments and things with my slightly more souped up trawler. And I think because it's sort of not really stopping me from sort of uh, playing the mechanics, as you put it, that's slightly to the detriment of the atmosphere. And I, th- I think I, just from a design point of view, I find that really interesting tension, right? Like how, how do you incentivize players to play in the most atmospheric way in a game that is also fundamentally about efficiency and and openly so right like it is it is openly a game about efficiency right and mm. and every in every every play in every meaningful system it presents to you and i just think that's it. it's an interesting conundrum but i do think it's a success atmospherically for the most part yeah i agree i think frustration with the efficiency stuff isn't that it's 
isn't that it's about that. It's it's that it, it it's so explicitly gate stuff with that. Yeah. Uh, by limiting your efficiency, I was going to say artificially, but that, that's not quite right, is it? I, I don't object to a game sort of like parceling out bits of content or blocking them off uh, or delaying you from getting to them. But I, I feel like it's more satisfying when that bottleneck is decided by my ability to enjoy those things. Like if if a bit of content is given to me too quickly, then I might mm. not have spent enough time with the preceding piece of content to have explored it properly or understand it properly. And so that I like it when that the pacing is down to the player rather than um, down to some comp- nakedly designed sense of pacing, <laughs> you know, that is being right. projected onto me. Um, I, I suppose I, I, I object to that purely because, like you say, there is it pulls me away from the other thing that the game is trying to achieve, which is this atmosphere and there's this sense of questions that need to be answered. And if I'm not able to answer those questions because my beat, you know, my boat only goes at X speed and I will need to get, you know, 10 crabs in order to uh, <laughs> get to somewhere. That's not, that's not a kind of interesting problem. To, to, it's not a sufficiently interesting problem to, to delay my ability to answer that question yeah i think but then again you know the mutated fish art is superb like there's some really grotesquely mutated fish the character design in this game is absolutely superb just amazing um i'm not quite sure even how to describe the style in which it's done the very explicit sort of daub like strokes that make up the kind of the texture of these portraits but each stroke is incredibly sharply accentuated like it's almost completely created out of rhombuses <laughs> um <laughs> it's a really interesting style because it's it's both kind of extremely um overtly painterly but in a way which could only ever be achieved digitally uh, and that's mm. that's really interesting uh and the, the, the you know some of the just the caricatures are, are fantastic like the fishmonger is just the, the the most unseemly fishmonger you can imagine like that guy has an unhealthy relationship with his work <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that is um and i think that is high praise coming from a, a man who as far as anyone can tell now generates unseemly fishmongers <laughs> for a living um you know I, I i trust you implicitly in this regard um master of the explicit stroke if anything um <laughs> what do you feel about the, the whole uh it's sort of lovecraftian pose do you feel like that it has it's achieving that with any kind of depth or nuance or novelty i, th- I think uh so i feel like i want to kind of let it tell its story before i kind of deliver right. a final final verdict on that i'm finding it's interesting really i'm finding like we are not wanting for stories like this at the moment, right? Like, I mean, let's be honest, we're not even wanting for top-down perspective or like isometric perspective games where you control a little boat in a cosmic horror setting, right? Like, Mm. you know, some of the seas also exists, some of the skies also exists, and those games are comparable to this. Um, You know, and I think there's... um, And I think that those games, the Sunless games are the most pertinent comparison. Those are much bigger games in terms of scale and depth of the writing and they're much more you know they're much more you know they they are interactive fiction games with the kind of open world exploration resource element built on top um this is a i think a a tighter and more interesting resource game more intentional resource game but less deep on the other side but they could remix is some similar elements and i think um um but similarly you know we're not exactly um we're not exactly wanting for like lonely fishing village experiences in this medium at the moment, right? There's sort of, it is, there's a kind of a wealth of this. And I think, um, I'm trying, like, I think for me, um, success in this regard is, is always a matter of presentation and surprise, I think. And, like slow revelation and so i think some of the things that you're kind of discussing in terms of like its pacing are key to its success and failure as a um 
of like a Lovecraft game of some kind. Like the because so for me the bits that have been the most successful are like the slow reveal of some of those mutated fish or the little touches of the uh, particularly at night and the one like wondering what's out there in the fog, for example. Honestly, like one of its nicest touches is when you're pootling along at night as your panic increases, sometimes rocks just materialize in front of you out of nowhere. Mm. And it creates, and the combination of VFX, Fog of War, or the way it does it, creates this incredibly convincing effect that you have simply failed to see it in time, even though I'm pretty sure the game is generating them in front of you, which is really nice and very clever and very subtle and just create that feeling of like you're being, you're being slightly out of control. I think as ever with these kinds of games, the, uh, I don't want to kind of spoil too much necessarily, but like the real threats, I think, are quickly understood in some ways um or once you start to pass them you can sort of start to avoid them and i think at that territory we we return to game territory from that brief moment of the unknown because like fear of the unknown is the whole point Mm. and if i were to make some you know i'm really to tie a bow on all of this because because ultimately if you're talking about stories about lonely fishing villages sea mysteries scary monsters um cults you know iconography ancient ruins etc all of that stuff there's a lot of it around and for me like for it to really work the atmosphere really needs to be solid and i think dredge gets there quite a bit in a way in a way i almost wish the horror element wasn't like a back of the box feature but more of a surprise because one thing that occurred to me is the other game that it sort of superficially resembles sort of is got the kind like well actually not at all no it doesn't resemble it i'm thinking this because at the beginning of the game a mayor says you're in debt to the town you need to pay off your debt before you do anything else and that made me think of animal crossing and animal crossing would be an incredible game to really just release a slow burn horror element into <laughs> yeah. it would be right yeah like and so because that sort of slow reveal of something being uncanny or off i think can be really powerful and i think this game achieves that the one, the other ones that I would compare it to, um, you know, so I've obviously mentioned the Sunless games, which are also explicitly sort of um, cosmic horror uh, settings. Um, Obra Dinn would be the other one, just in terms of like nautical horror, interesting nautical horror mm. and kind of processing it. And Obra Dinn, I would say, is more successful because of the way it slowly kind of reveals its strangenesses, you know? Yeah. Um, also, more recently, because another game I have been playing is um, Case of the Golden Idol, which is much sillier and lighter in some ways, but also kind of just lets its little vignettes um, sit, you know, to let them kind of mm. stand as little horror moments. Like, why is that man spontaneously combusted? I don't know. Let's do a <laughs> word search. Um, and I find that um, gameplay logic game mechanics problem solving all of that is the enemy of this kind of horror and always has been and always will be um and so um there's a really interesting juxtaposition between the logic control the things people come to a fishing game for the -hmm. logical kind of rational systems and the kind of mercantile pursuit of it versus the kind of unfathomable i where i'm at so far is i'm really enjoying it and i think it's really interesting i want to solve its puzzles and complete it but i i feel like it's becoming quite fathomable quite quickly and that means that i've slipped into a different (laughs) exactly yeah it's a it's a a sea pun it was it was it was an ocean bant and (laughs) um and uh and uh and as a consequence it's becoming more like a atmospheric adventure game rather than like a meaningful inter- interface with that kind of horror, if that makes sense. I appreciate that was yeah. a big old, I just had a big explicit stroke of my own um, <laughs> trying to articulate how I feel about that. But like, I've got strong feelings about that kind of horror, but also I think that like most things are bad at capturing them. It's just just the case that, you know, these kinds of games or games generally sometimes have a decent shot at it, but not always, you know? I don't know. How are you finding it in that regard? Like I said, I, I, at the outset, I, I find the kind of the, the totality of it quite um beguiling and uh, i think i will play it to completion i i'm about two-thirds of the way through it now and i will i will finish it but um yeah there's there's something awkward in its uh combination actually i tell you what the game that it made me think of which is uh you know dissimilar from it in mechanism almost entirely is strange horticulture hmm. 
in that that is that's a game with a sort of mercantile overlayer with an uncanny story threaded through and a central activity which is orthogonal to that um discovery um and yet i found that a lot more kind of coherent um in the way that it operated possibly because the central activity itself which is more of an information game like you're identifying different plants in that using you know uh, a, a disparate array of tools to lock down certain facts and narrow in on a um a diagnosis what's the, what's the right word diagnosis <laughs> plant uh, um, um identification yeah yeah that's that's how words work um but that was a much more satisfactory and sort of intellectually engaging process and i don't think i'd want something that was necessarily cerebral injected into dredge as opposed to purely kind of uh you know mechanical I don't know what I'm wanting for really. I, maybe I want a pure aesthetic game, which is just about yeah. you know boating and really the 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 mechanical aspects of fishing don't, or at least the the, the trading and the upgrading and all of that kind of frippery goes away and just gets subsumed by the 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 horror aesthetic, you know, the spooky traversal, yeah. etc. I'm thinking about like I agree with you. I, I think there's a really interesting tension between these kinds of like very kind of like full featured, well, full featured in the concept of fishing game, open world games, and horror specifically or atmosphere. Because you're right that a kind of both a more aesthetic experience, but also something that leaves more to the imagination can sometimes be more powerful. Right, Oberdin's a good example of that. Mm. Um, but also, like I was just thinking, um, I had a run recently of saying, "Have you seen?" Um, the movie Bait or the movie Ennis Main? I have not. Uh, two Mark Jenkins movies, both um, kind of uh, tonally relevant to this, given that Bait is about fishing and um, is is really fascinatingly made as a movie. And, um, and Ennis Main is about a, just a lonely island and both of them um, uh, sort of place a huge amount of weight on your own interpretive process trying to figure out what genre you're in really you mm. know what i mean and just so sort of taking in these landscapes and the the effect of the sea on on your brain and the kind of bait particularly which i think is a great film um i won't spoil anything about it but um i think if you liked the lighthouse particularly which I know a lot of people did then you should mm. say it you watch it um um invites you to speculate what kind of film it is um pretty pretty consistently um and i won't answer that without spoiling it but there's <laughs> there is it but but it does that because it exists primarily in your imagination like a lot of good horror films right like it, it, mm. it you know it lets you kind of sit with just vibes basically and sort of project onto you know that experience and fishing actually is a great match for that because it is a solitary ruminative pursuit Right, mm. and um, and this and dredge dredge's tension is slightly different. Dredge is actually ultimately quite a cute fishing game. Fishing is quick and fun. Um, yeah, kind of I mean that's kind of that, that's exactly it. You've you've completely nailed it. That that is my disfas- dissatisfaction with it because I feel like the 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 experience of being a lone fisherman on trawler is re- re- you know redolent with the uncanny. Mm. Uh, you know the, the stink of the nets, the gulls, the, you know, as your only friends, rocking yeah. about on this uh, empty ocean as fog rolls in and clattering of sheets against the mast, etc. All of that stuff could be incredibly powerful, combined with the existing kind of direction that the aesthetic's going in, and yet it it squanders all of that to make it this kind of incredibly trivial rhythm action game, and. That that seems tragic. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't hate the the match game myself really, um, but I because I think it's sort of in keeping with what this game otherwise is. But I mm. agree with you. Like I think it gestures at the existence of a different game, which is probably something more like a sort of slow burn VR fishing horror game, which I would one hundred percent play. Yeah. Right, where like you know you're you're gutting that weird card yourself. Um, but um, I think the other thing, the other tension is because because it's also a, you know, like it's a game with an economy and progress and stuff like that. The loss of your things matters, but in a kind of, in terms of inconvenience. And I think 
Um, what I mean by that is like, let's say, for example, some sort of spooky ocean terror stole all your crabs, right? Like in in character terms, the, the real takeaway from that should be there was a spooky ocean terror. In player terms, the experience is I have lost all my crabs. Please, my crabs <laughs> yeah. are gone. You know, and what that means is I guess I'm going to have to go get my crab pots repaired and then catch some more crabs. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you will, you will quick, like, and I think that's one of the, one, one of the other things I would raise. And I don't raise any of this because I'm actually really enjoying the game and I appreciate it as much as I'm negative so much just to kind of like explore some of the problems that these games encounter. One of them is what can you threaten the player with? And in a fishing game, it makes sense. You can threaten them with the loss of their catch, right? Like that's that makes sense, or with the potentially dangerous slow crawl back to port if one of your engines gets damaged or something like that. That all makes sense, but all of that is effectively inconvenience, and um, and, and you know, most horror games have this issue. But when that is the when that is the cost, you know, and that in different game that could be manifest as the inconvenience is being reset back to a checkpoint because you died, right? Doesn't really matter mm. what it is. It's just you've lost some of your time and you're gonna have to repeat something. And I think that also just as mechanism in games has the effect of eating away its ability to scare you past a certain point because you're like, okay, well, there's, and this is not a spoiler for Dredge, I'm going to say things that, well, to my experience, aren't my experience. Like, there's, oh, there's Cthulhu. I better go. Uh, I've got quite a rare crab, which is not (laughs) like, you know, that's not, that's not the desired outcome of that encounter from most storytelling perspectives. Mm. But it seems to have been a huge success with certain people. Um, I know Catherine at Rock Paper Shotgun absolutely loved it. And I read her review earlier and I, I, you know, I can't fault it. Mm. (laughs) Like she had a great time with it and it really, really worked for her. Um, Yeah. I find it interesting because for me, it is both and not a great Steam Deck game, mm. which, and the reason I say that is because um, just sort of lying down and playing it on the Steam Deck and doing a bit of pootling and fishing is like the kind of thing Steam Deck's really good for. Like, I'm just going to pootle a bit on this resource game, you know, and, and while I'm doing something else or just while I'm sort of doing something mindlessly on the couch. Um, but it also wants your immersion, you know, it wants your kind of full absorption into it. And so for me, it's, it's like sort of, I can never really quite tell where it needs me to be you know what i mean like what level of comfortable do you want me to be cozy horror game <laughs> yeah. and that is the that is the interesting conundrum cozy of the cozy horror, horror game yeah right? like that's a really uh, good way of expressing it yeah it's like a it's like a a knitted jumper on the body of a craven fisherman <laughs> Yeah, I guess that is also another similarity with strange horticulture. That is, mm. they, they both exist within the cozy horror genre, both kind of ruminative and very kind of relaxing games, but with a spooky soundtrack. I mean, and I guess this is like it's interesting. Maybe this is simply a genre, and it's got value in its own right, right? Like, because arguably, like you know, Scorn, for example, is trying desperately hard not to be cozy horror while also being missed. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> It was pretty relaxing, actually, Scorn. Yeah, exactly. Way. Yeah. <laughs> and that's valid, right? Like, maybe maybe we're attributing intent that they're not intending to follow through on, you know? Like, mm-hmm. fascinating. I shall return to it, then. Good. Let me know. Let me know how you get on with the fishies. Mm. Yeah, I imagine my boat will get bigger and faster, but so will the fish. That's my expectation. We'll see if it burns out. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Curse of the Golden Idol. You've been playing that as well. I have. Yeah, I haven't finished it yet, but I do enjoy it quite a lot. I found that's uh, um, uh, I really like Curse of the Golden Idol. I appreciate it's been talked about in the pod before, has almost every, as has almost everything that I've played for the last couple of months. Um, but um, so if you're if you're not aware, this is a um, sort of consciously old school um, puzzle adventure game um, where you. Uh, you look at you know a scene usually made up of several screens of I guess Monkey Island uh, one and two style you know kind of type vignettes um, which represent a single moment frozen in time and you can browse around those and and hoover up lots of words and and sort of uh, phrases that might be found in the environment in some way or in descriptions and then you are tasked to it's an information game where you are tasked to assemble those into effectively 
solutions to puzzles. So effectively, like identifying the characters in the scene, identifying who has done what to whom, um, and how the particular moment has come about. And over the course of many of these vignettes, you start to piece together a story about a golden idol. And it's a, you know, again, a kind of, you know, um, sort of cosmic horror adjacent sort of yarn set in, I think, Regency England, which is quite a fun setting for something like this. Um, and um, and I like it a lot. Um, but I think I find it, um, but the thing that I've liked the most about it is, for me, it's like, first and foremost, a, I would describe it as like, it's a, it's, it's first and foremost a puzzle game, rather than like a story game or a horror experience. And to me, it tickles the same part of my brain that is, um, that is, feels compelled to try and show off if I go to an escape room. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like the part which is like engaging with the the story or the, you know, the kind of the the setting for the puzzle, but also fundamentally engaging with the designer. Like, okay, what is what is being placed here and what am I gonna be what am I gonna be solving today? Is this puzzle gonna be about place settings at a dinner? Is it going to be about the position of rooms in a house? Is it going to be about masks or costumes or something else right like those sorts of like what are the mechanics and then let me at them and so i actually sort of whipped through the first half of it in about an hour and a half and it was great like just sort of speed running it but um like um but i do really like it and i, I think the i think its presentation is really fun and the um and the sort of um also a great a great rendering of particularly kind of uh grotesque british faces oh you know? yeah I think, in fact, that's probably the last game that I uh, described the caricatures in it with the same effusiveness as I just did to yeah. Dredge's uh, superb noses. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, and that's and that's actually nice because it's, it's really important. Like, your ability to recognize different characters in different circumstances is, a, is, a, is part of the puzzle solving. And it's kind of cool that they are information in that sense as well. A nose is information. It's a true. nose is information. That is true. Um, but yes, I like it a great deal. Did you did you enjoy it much? Oh, I, I thought it was superb. Yeah, I really had a great time with it. I can't remember much about it now, so I, <laughs> I can't, okay. read, can't really talk. I do remember it having, it like curtailing the possibility space of the 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 words you're putting in by having phrases in the in the screen where you're sort of judged upon mm. your um, understanding of a scene, and so instead of uh, you know it, it being quite as open as um, Oberdin, it, it curtailed the possibilities of the exact nouns that you were looking for by having a phrase with blanks in it. And I, I thought that was obviously both limiting the, the the range of possibilities in a helpful way to the player, um, but also allowed it to do more inventive and expressive things in the kinds of scenarios it's proposing, because then it could ask you a specific question about them. Um, yeah. Whereas if it was completely open, it would have to be in some ways more predictable in the kinds of questions that it would ask you in order not to just completely bamboozle uh, a player with possibility. Um, so I thought it was really well judged in that respect. Yeah, it's. I, I think the you know um, it's brutable in some ways in some moments, but like mm. you know, and it was a reasonable thing. I think it does a good job of those sentence structures where you start to pass them, or the ways it kind of mixes things up with words that can go multiple places and so on, or or fields that can be filled with multiple kinds of words kind of adds grammar as a fun extra game um, to play on top of it. I think, so I'm someone who does a lot of crosswords <laughs> and like it sort of has that element to it as well, right? Learning, learning how the clue setter thinks is mm. part of playing it. And that's what I kind of mean by the, um, you know, you know, teacher's pet in a escape room mentality, <laughs> right? Is like the person who desperately wants to told, be told that you set a good time when your team emerges from the escape room, even though they say that to everybody. Um, <laughs> you know uh, that that sort of pays off, I think. But yeah, I, I think um, you know, uh, uh, hack mode years ago, we put a similar mechanic into that game, and it's 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 a tricky balance to get right. And I think they get it really right, like how much to give in the clue, in the structure of the clue, versus how much to kind of leave um, up to interpretation, and and how that's weighted and the fact that, and I think also that like those sorts of like detail, both detail dense, but very readable sort of nineties pixel art backgrounds are actually a really good way of conveying that kind of information. The the thing I found, we're talking about Oberdin a lot today, but the reason I found Oberdin 
a really compelling but also not an entirely pleasant experience was because I think it's I think its visual style is talking about like retro visual styles kind of necessary for the kind of game it is and definitely very atmospheric but also just from at least to my eyes very hard to read just very hard to read and um that sort of forced me to play it in this sort of painstaking way that ultimately I found quite unpleasant as kind of atmospheric not not unintentionally so but like it was hard going and whereas this I find quite breezy because of the whack fact that like I can quick quickly shake down the environment for all the keywords I need and then just look at the details and try and tell myself the story and I find that quite pleasant perspective is also a factor there being shown mm. being shown the scenes as 2d scenes to take up the whole screen rather than forcing you into that you know first person perspective where you can get lost perspective is a really big part of it as well actually right yeah yeah it's very good at guiding you it is uh, without really needing to guide you at all in fact it removes the need to guide you <laughs> i think is what i'm trying to say um yeah. Yeah. There's something very comfortable about that. A bit like, um, I mean, to be honest, one thing is really, it is also a effectively like an advanced hidden object game, to yeah. be honest, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not quite as simple as just like a, an iPad hidden object, search them up. But, you know, talking about fishing games and all those sort of things, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like, that coziness, there's, there really is nothing wrong with it. Like, the kind of the fun of gradually solving a puzzle doesn't have to be about difficulty all the time hmm. and i find that quite uh yeah it's it's a it's a soothing experience and i think it's a worthwhile thing for a puzzle game to be basically hmm. Hmm. can i on, while we were on the subject of earlier we were on the subject of efficiency can i can i tell you about probably one of the worst things i've done to another <laughs> human being in a game oh god yes <laughs> i thought this would pique your interest it's about efficiency in the sense that I don't think I feel I'm going to feel quite bad telling the story, but I think I really have meaningfully wasted someone else's time in a way that is impossible to ever apologize for. And I'm <laughs> oh, deeply proud of myself. <laughs> and so, so the last time I was on the podcast was back in January and I told Jamie about my uh, Marvel snap addiction. And uh, that has remained. I still play it quite a bit. Um, I like it quite a lot. I've fallen down a hole with it a little bit. It is something to do. It's very compelling. Um, it's been talked about on the podcast a couple of times now. So I'll, I'll explain the mechanics briefly, but that's not really the point of the story. Um, but uh, are you familiar with how it works, Marshall? I, I mean, I know the basics, I think. Sure. So very basic three lane strategy game, uh, huge pile of cards and rules that overlap each other, ro rules for the lanes themselves and each, uh, you know, it, but a very short form card battler by some of the same people who made Hearthstone where you are competing over the course of six turns. So really six cards to achieve a maximum power score in two out of three lanes. And these games are very, very quick. They can be over in 45 seconds to a minute if if the turns are played quickly. And, you know, the, it certainly has its sort of balance issues and, and, and ups and downs and so on. But I think as a short form, quick fire, just fucking make some decisions about some game mechanics and then stop game. It's great, really. Like you can, you know, I could ramble on about its business model and the way it kind of pulls you in and doesn't and so on and the grindiness at the higher levels and but that's not the point. I think this is the sort of thing, like most good deck building games, where you kind of, at some point, you make a decision to either really care about winning or make your own fun, right? Just enjoy the mechanics for their own sake. I'm really happy to say that I have completed Marvel Snap now. For You've me. completed it. I've completed it. You've I've comple played everybody who has played it. Yes, and I don't say that because I have hit the highest rank because I, I can't get past Diamond, but... I have, I have, I think, I don't think it is possible to waste someone else's time more than I have now wasted their time. <laughs> and so... How did, how did you achieve this? I need to tell you that. I've been waiting to tell the story for a while. I wanted to be on the podcast to do this, this, to waste your time as well. Ha <laughs> um, <laughs> It's me, the time vampire. Um, the, um, no, so basically... I figured something out a while ago that I realized I had to do it, but it required very specific circumstances. So um, 
Marvel Snap, as I've said, is a game where the game is over in like, you know, 45 seconds to a minute most of the time, maybe even less. Um, and, you know, because of this, no, you know, you know, like it's, it's just quick decisions, quick resolutions and so on. And, um, but they've put a lot of work into the presentation. So cards have, you know, um, not like the mind blowing effects, but there'll be animations and effects for the reveal of cards, certain abilities and so on. Now, um, many of uh, many cards fall into one of two categories. They either have an on-reveal effect or an ongoing effect. It's kind of self-explanatory. An ongoing effect persists for as long as that card is in the lane and it might affect its own lane or the entire board, whatever. An on-reveal effect triggers when the card is revealed. Right. Very simple, right? Um, and often those on-reveal effects do have a, a kind of little animation. Sometimes they're like pretty spectacular, like some of the big ones, like, you know, destroying a lane or something like that. Um, and sometimes it's just a silly little animation. Um, but um, normally, you know, they you play the card, they do their thing, and then that's that done. However, uh, one of the longer of these animations I realized was the Silver Surfer. When you play the Silver Surfer, the Silver Surfer uh, costs three power, so you can be played on turn three or later. And he, you place him, he's revealed he flies around the entire board and on his little surfboard and he adds two power to every three cost card he passes on his little journey that's what the silver surfer does now it's really important that he both has a bullshit animation and costs three power or less okay. um so um there are other cards that interact with the principle of an unreveal card uh wong is is one of these uh, if Wong is in a lane, he has an ongoing effect, which causes on-reveal effects to trigger twice rather than oh, once. I um, see. Right. <clears throat> and I started to see a little pattern. I was playing with this. And then there are certain things you can do. Um, Mystique, the the X, uh, X-Man, X-Man character who, can, who turns into other people, uh, if you play her, she copies the, the ability of... If, if you're the last card you played before her had an ongoing ability, she copies it. Um, so that it's possible to have Wong and Mystique for two lots of two. And then uh, there is uh, Odin, for example. If you play Odin to a lane, he's a very expensive card. It costs six. He triggers the on-reveal abilities of any other cards in the lane he's in to happen again. Um, now, uh, there is also... And then I started to play with this. There's a there's a location that also causes on-reveals on to happen twice. But there is also a location called Onslaught Citadel that causes all ongoing effects to be doubled. And I figured out, as probably many people have, that this basically creates a mathematical cap for how many times an ongoing, uh, an unreveal effect can happen. And in, in by, by default, it's 16. Um, oh because, um, you know, if you play Wong, then Mystique, then Odin... Odin will trigger four times, two twice each for the other two. And then any one that Odin triggers will trigger four times. So it's four times four, 16. However, in Onslaught Citadel, it is possible to get that to 64 times because <laughs> Onslaught Citadel doubles Wong and Mystique. So Odin triggers eight times, triggering both Wong and Mystique to trigger four times each, which would then cause whatever card is being triggered to trigger eight times per Odin, which is eight times eight, so 64. Um, and then, so basically this can only happen mathematically with a card that has a cost of three or lower because of the sequencing when you have to play things. And that means it requires Onslaught Citadel to be one of the first um, things to trigger. So I just realized that um, you could do this with Silver Surfer because he costs three. The very funny thing about this is he only he buffs three cost cards other than himself so the only thing he can possibly buff is mystique who's in the same lane as him anyway um i made this deck that i called endless surfering and then <laughs> i was like this is never going to actually happen right like because it's just you need because also bear in mind you need those cards in your hand right like out of everything else in your deck you need those cards to happen and then i literally had this deck for about like a game and i was like i was drinking a coffee and eating a bacon roll in a covered market in bath and suddenly i see that i start the game with like three out of the four cards in my hand 
and Onslaught Citadel as the first location. And I'm like, could it? Could it happen? I'm so excited. I have to Google um, how to screen record um, my iPhone. <laughs> I do have a video of this. And I'm like, the pieces all fall into place. And there's a weird thing about the lane. I could talk about the exact game setup, but basically neither of us play a card to the furthest lane. It's important that one remain neutral. And then there's like a scrap over the other two. It's a back and forth. And like I initially play the Silver Surfer. He doesn't buff anybody. And then I we get to the end of that game. And um, <laughs> this poor person, wherever they were in the world, could have been on the poo. They could be having a poo. They could have been on the bus. They could have been playing that one last game before they were going to get on with whatever they were going to get on with. Um, and it all came, it all happened. I, I, I did it. I did the thing that I was convinced I was going to try and do for the entire time that it was going to be my end game for Marvel Snap. And guess what, Marsh? The Silver Surfer flew around the screen for three minutes and 45 <laughs> seconds without stopping. He just kept going. He just kept, he gets up, he flies around, he stops, he comes back, he gets up, he does it again. He does that eight times, then Odin triggers again, and he just keeps fucking going. <laughs> and because this game is intended to be played and enjoyed in like, you know, 45 second mini matches, there's no way to quit. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do other than emote. And and so at a certain point, I just kept doing the little thumbs up emote as the Silver Surfer kept fucking going forever. It was fucking incredible. It was honestly one of the best things I've ever done in a game. <laughs> and I should apologize, but I won't. <laughs> Um, I, I, I've got a, I've got a sped up video, which I might be able to try and find some way to get into the show notes. Cause it is just, a, I mean, I've sped it up by four times so that it only takes a minute of the silver surfer just fucking going and going and going and going since then I have actually got a new mission now and I'm still playing the game because they've added a new card called hit monkey <laughs> who costs four and, uh, his on reveal effect is he gains two power for every other card played that turn. So it's utterly pointless to trigger him at the end of the game, really, kinda. But when he triggers, he fires guns and bananas everywhere and goes ooh ooh ah ah. And like, <laughs> it is hypothetically impossible. It's hypothetically possible for me to force someone else to listen to that sixty four times over the course of i think that one would probably only take about two minutes to get through because it is like yeah probably about two and a half minutes of him going ooh ah, ah. but hypothetically i could do that to another human being <laughs> what would you call game. that deck um it's it's currently called it is currently called monkey business but i do need to come up with another <laughs> name for it can your opponent uh, see the name of your deck they can't, but I wish you could reveal them at the end. <laughs> like that would be such a. I really wish I could reveal the end, the name of the deck. <laughs> um, but no, um, I, I think about it a lot. Like who that? Who, who was that person that I wasted? Like I mean, mm. yeah, just maybe three just, and a half minutes uh, and never getting back. Somebody in the, in the just taking a break from the incredibly tricky brain surgery they were conducting. I really could have just just thoroughly ruined a day. You know what I mean? Someone <laughs> just sat down like they've had a really shit morning. They're like, you know what? I've got time for one edifying game of Marvel Snap before I go back to what I'm doing. And then it's just the fucking Silver Surfer doing <laughs> donuts in their <laughs> front garden for ever. Oh, I'm genuinely beautiful. proud of myself. Yeah, genuinely proud of myself. The most Loki-ish uh, <laughs> manner of playing that game, I think. Yeah, right. It's the kind of satisfaction you can't get from uh, something like Slay the Spire, a better game. But the only, but the only person's time you're allowed to thoroughly waste there is your own. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my. Uh, I did need to tell you that. that that's, that's great. My, that's my <laughs> Marvel Snap story. I love that you ruined somebody else's day. Thought you'd like it. Um, what else have you been playing, Marsh? I believe you have returned to a game that we once um, lost a huge amount of our own time to. <laughs> Talking about wasting other people's time as well. Gosh, the people who listen to that episode, um, two and a half, two, and two hours, 45 minutes of mostly Star Wars, all caps, Jedi, title case, colon, fallen order, TM, superscript. Uh, the game, which is about to receive a sequel this week. Um, Indeed. And I, I found myself really looking forward to the sequel without having hmm. any recollection of why. <laughs> <laughs> I, and what's weird about it is that despite us recording an entire podcast about it, um, which I don't expect to be memorable considering the amount of alcohol we consumed, but I don't remember anything about the game apart from the fact it had a big rock cutting tool in it, <laughs> which is what? just a, a weird thing to stick with you. 
um, given all the other kind of spectacle in the game. No, it was it was the giant rock cutting tool that I remember. Um, anyway, I'm I'm now replaying it, and I'm I'm really enjoying it actually. Um, more so, I think, than the first time round. But I was trying to figure out why I had retained so few specifics of it beyond mm. like a generalized but sort of tentative goodwill towards it and a sort of non specific enthusiasm for a sequel um and yeah it, I mean, it's not short of like kind of a, a visually amazing moments like there's there's huge you know crash star destroyers that you enter and, and you know amazing ice planets and so forth and all, all the kinds of things that you would expect from uh, a huge mega budget star wars game but i think there's just there's a lot about it which is sort of this is interesting going this is going back sort of towards uh our, our discussion about dredge and the sort of the nature of activity and the kind of aesthetic that that generates and whether that can that is empowered because it's attached to something or, or not mm. attached to something i feel like um there's a lot of it which is just shy of finding like a definite purpose to it there's just mm. a sort of a, a reticence to like own any of the things that it does sort of mechanically or narratively and a lot of what it's doing is like cool and i'm like enjoying it in the moment and it's borrowed all these kind of uh, the structure and, and mechanisms from other games um, which i admire um but it always feels like the payoff the like, the reason that you would have done that cool thing it's just in the next room mm. and it isn't quite ever but what is in the next room is a fucking poncho <laughs> 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 um but like I mean, you you were a lot more um, into. So I went back and listened to a bit of the the, the previous car crash podcast <laughs> we did about this, um, and you were a lot more enthusiastic about it than I was. I don't think um, I was act. I actually felt that negatively about it when I was playing it the last time. But for some reason, out of you know sheer perversity, I decided to to take a stronger line against it when we were discussing <laughs> it than I actually felt. Um, <laughs> But I think this has been thrown into some kind of relief as well by the, the recent Star Wars series that have attempted with varying levels of effectiveness to sort of insert themselves within an existing canon. And that's like mm. the, the, the perennial problem, particularly with the Star Wars games, but also with, for example, the Obi-Wan TV series, is that it has to create all of this drama within this tiny interstitial space without it actually affecting anything outside of that like it's the, like yeah. like raccoons living inside a wall cavity trying to sneak into your kitchen to eat your biscuits at night and like but also they replace the biscuits just to make sure that you never actually <laughs> realized they were there yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, but, yeah, and i don't think they do a bad job of it in this game like i i it's it's a compelling story i actually like the characters and so forth but they are but you can't. You can tell that they're tied down. Yeah. At, at the same time, not only they're tied down, but they're trying to do something on a much grander scale than is premised by uh, Andor, for example, the TV series Andor. And yet, ironically, despite Andor being quite a low-key and intimate story of rebellion, that actually does tie into the plot of the movies in a very significant way, or it will do. And this game never will. You know, like, <laughs> despite it being about right. bringing back the Jedi Order, which you would think would have some significance. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go. Oh, well, I'm just going to carry on rambling. But if you have, <laughs> if you feel anything about things, please do say. Oh, I mean, me feel things about Star Wars. No, I mean, I, was, I think, I, and honestly, I just feel like most Star Wars for the last couple of years had to make a choice about whether to be trapped like that. And because I, I feel like it is a choice, you know what I mean? And like, I don't, it doesn't surprise me that sort of, uh, obviously it's official material, but stuff on the periphery, like games is a little bit sandwiched in it, but also a little bit freer to go its own direction in some ways mm. because of the medium. Um, I really, you know, for what it's worth, I, I really do feel like the, um, you know, the, the TV shows are in a very strange place where like Andor kind of came along and was quietly one of the best bits of TV sci-fi in years mm. and genuinely great on its own merits. And everything else is absolute trash, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, you know, both the most recent season of Mandalorian, Boba Fett, Obi Wan are all like they're not god awful, but there's no excuse for them being as bad as they are, in my mm. opinion. And like that's a sort of, um, but part of that, uh, you know, and maybe that's controversial, maybe it's not, but part of that is because they are contorted into this, can't you know, sort of. Um, 
contorted into this sort of service to a, a greater, you know, story, I suppose, or a bigger universe, or in, in Mandalorian's case, particularly the kind of the decisions of the sequel movies. Um, and yeah, I think maybe we just lost my patience for that completely. Whereas I think um, when the, where they are successful to return to Fallen Order, it's when they can kind of deliver just like a moment of spectacle or atmosphere to return to that word that it just sort of places you in that setting for a moment and kind of captures something of its kind of fantasy, its core fantasy. And I think Fallen Order is kind of like good for that. Like even as it sort of ties itself in knots a little bit, trying to tell something of kind of grand scale when it's not really allowed to Mm. by the terms of the broader story, it's still using that to make sure that you have an excuse to go to a cool place and see a big thing, which Mm. is really like, you know, a fundamental promise of those stories that ironically they've struggled with a bit more recently when everything is being filmed in front of a volume screen. Yeah. 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 But I wonder if that just that sort of, uh, that detaching, that detachment from some larger purpose is what makes it feel immemorable in some way, or is, is what helped it slip out of my memory. I, th- I think it's true, like mechanically as well. Like, so it's structured around these very non-linear levels, or at least appear non-linear levels, which have something of like the Dark Souls structure of shortcutting back to spawn points, and something of like the Metroidvania structure of ability gating parts of the environment. So actually, your route through them are is at times quite linear but it's it nonetheless often requires a lot of crisscrossing and backtracking and that's no no bad thing at all like i i think the first time we discussed it you said that it, it, it sort of if you were to play an uncharted now you'd almost do it ex- on our autopilot whereas that mm-hmm. that level of that kind of breadth of freedom to the degree that it offers you it helped jog you out of like just comfortable triple a cinematic adventure autopilot setting and it does do that and it's and i think that is a to its credit and a real merit of the game but then i don't know that it does like anything else with that like what is what is the purpose of all that crisscrossing and backtracking apart from that kind of that momentary sensation or of uh jostling you into some form of alertness about your environment like it's 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 a really nice texture almost it's like mm. a pleasant thing to play but it never really makes a case for why you are doing that structurally and it often abandons it as well because it railroads you then with cutscenes or like non-consensually triggered diversions and it's i was, I was going to say it's, it's it's a sort of pose but it's not it's, it's not a pose in the sense that it's it, i don't feel like it's insincere or fake in any way yeah i think it's intentional i think it's intentionally there for flavor but it's it is a flavor, and it's not the real thing. <laughs> you know what I mean. And maybe that, and and like I think that's sometimes enough. And I think that can be your goal as a game designer. Like I remember a Call of Duty game a few years back. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. I, it's the one set in the future where you're basically RoboCop and Kevin Spacey is your evil daddy. Infinite Warfare could have been that one. Maybe. Uh, but anyway, it had all these like upgrade systems, super soldier upgrade systems that they perform different um, attacks amongst other things. And there were loads of them and it had a really complicated skill tree, but they essentially gravitated around two or three very distinct mechanical functions. Like some would let you deal damage directly, others would distract enemies and another set would enhance your, your traversal abilities, I think. But instead of being categorized like that and having oh three different things you can do there were loads of them and they were subdivided into more baffling categories like technology and cyber warfare and stuff like that that didn't actually relate to their function which was one of those three functions all the time right and uh like there's there's a skill that blasted enemies with some kind of sonic weapon that caused people to puke up their diaphragms and then there's another skill which like unleashes a swarm of robotic bees but both of those are essentially the same yeah. Because they paralyze or distract a number of enemies while you murder them. Uh, that's all they do. And I remember making a video for for Rock Paper Shotgun where I did some very uh, uh, ill-advised impromptu redesign of this and simplified it all down, boiled it all down, rationalized the button mapping, made it fewer powers, made them more kind of dramatically distinct. So I thought, good job. What a great game designer. What a great armchair game designer I am. And then, <laughs> and then uh, Paul Kilduff Taylor uh, of, of Mode 7 uh, responded to this on Twitter very cleverly and suggested that like the actual mechanical effect of all these skills 
was not the goal. <laughs> the, the goal was the aesthetic of having a lot of upgrades. And, yes. and while I was looking at it going, yeah, this is inefficient system design. You know, you don't need bees and puke. Pick one, bees or puke. Most people were just <laughs> were just excited by the feeling of having like a complex skill tree and the superficiality of it just didn't matter at all. Mm. But, but then again, I can barely remember that game's existence. And it's possibly only because I made a video about it and then got a, a taught a lesson on Twitter <laughs> that I remember it at all. And I wonder whether that, that lack of true synergy is what makes it immemorable. And I wonder if that's also what makes elements of Fallen Order harder to recall. Like, why am I going the here or there? And the game's saying, you know, not incorrectly, don't worry, it doesn't matter. Just enjoy the feeling of being in this open space with these little loop backs and not very secret secrets that will reward you with different color ponchos. If you miss something, chill, you know? It's, it, probably, it probably was just a different kind of colored metal for your lightsaber grip <laughs> that you can't even see in game. Don't worry about it, it's fine. But also, by the same token, that lack of purposefulness means that when the f feeling generated by that structure has passed, you're not left with anything to, to hold on to. Yeah. Except, you know, in a literal sense of a lightsaber grip. But, you know, I don't remember that years later. Can I risk saying something really wank? Oh, please. I'm going to, this is in danger, but if, so you maybe, uh, or, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a really interesting problem because initially when you were like enjoying the flavor of, of you know, that sort of, lightly non-linear kind of element to the game or something it was actually making me think more about texture so this is this is wanky statement number one mm. and and for me i was like is it interesting that there's like a mismatch between the texture and the flavor is this a game that is crunchy like a biscuit but tastes like yogurt like what is like mm. what's the you know like is that anything and, and then what i realized as you were talking about call of duty was no it's not um but <laughs> Um, but what I'm thinking about, what, where that took me, and I think this is kind of interesting, is like, you don't, you don't remember ability. I don't really remember Fallen Order either, and I did like it. Um, and things like the, the superficial pleasures of like an upgrade tree for its own sake and those sorts of things is, I, my, this is a guess. This is the, the nature and trajectory of the wank is things tend to be more memorable if they have coherently taught you something. And what you know, talking about mismatch of flavor and texture would be one way of framing it. The other would be um, the ga those games sort of teach you uh, two. They have you managing two strands of information that are irrelevant to one another, right? So your the things you learn in order to traverse the environment and get all of the secrets are uh, is one strand of information with a low return, right? Like the return is a poncho or a copper lightsaber hilt or whatever it is. Then the other thread is the story of the game, which is the other reason you might be invested. Uh, think of these as like reasons to invest and things you need to learn to pursue those investments. One is I want a new poncho. I'm going to learn this sort of Dark Souls light navigation, level navigation. The other is um, I want to find out what happens to these characters. So I will kind of pursue that. But they're completely separate from one another. Either the game will put you on rails for a while to tell the story or launch you into a cutscene, all those things you said. And so the game is not teaching you anything coherent so your intellectual engagement with it is sort of like it's fine it's enjoyable at surface level but it's probably not like i don't know how the memory works i'm not going to claim to but it's like you're not it's not it's not coming together to a point mm. right like if you think of like most successful teaching math matches the kind of methodology to the outcome in some way that gathers towards a certain point whether that's a new skill or a language or whatever it is right like you're not learning that. The the comparison, and is the inevitable comparison, is how, you know, it's like, um, and that is what I would put that down to in the Fallen Order's case, is it's because it's the marriage of a fairly traditional um, AAA storytelling method, you know, levels followed by really, you know, uh, high production value cutscenes and so on, uh, with a little bit of that happening under the player's control through the levels themselves, married to and actually surprisingly non-linear-ish exploratory gameplay that isn't very good at telling that kind of story. And neither of them suit the other. Whereas if you look at how From Software tells stories with those methods, they pretty much exclusively tell stories about worlds 
where almost every aspect of that world and how it works and how the function, the functional sort of metaphysical logic of it is unknown to you at the point where the game begins. And the story and the beats of the story are highly tied into your increasing knowledge of how those worlds work and the way you explore those worlds is designed to teach you how those worlds work. So it's all kind of, it mm. all feeds into itself. You, you're, yeah. you're the, the greater mastery with which you explore those environments increases the depth of your understanding of the themes of the story, which allow you to kind of pull more out of the game with every subsequent run. It's impossible to apply that to a Star Wars game because, I mean, it would be incredible. Well, it would be incredibly bold of them to have a man, you know, to try and make a Star Wars game where every aspect of the universe is unknown to you, the player. But it's kind of impossible, right? Force mm. is going to be the force. You know, there's, you know, you could have a character who'd never heard of those things, but you, the player is going to have some idea how the setting works. And so, the, you know, the the stuff it's teaching you is. Uh, in terms of how to navigate the world and so on, it's just a completely different thread to the thing it's teaching you from a kind of you know import to the overall Star Wars universe point of view or the story of these particular characters. Mm. And so it doesn't really surprise me that 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 time isn't like intellect doesn't have much staying power intellectually over time, right? Whereas like you know I feel like if I think about the From Software games that I have really loved over the years, like Bloodborne or something like that the mechanics of that universe and the mechanics of the game and even the layout of the world is sort of like indelibly intertwined with one another in my head. Yeah. Um, and, you know, all the mechanics of certain bosses versus certain points, pop points in the story, even if it's just a kind of like a nod from one to the other, those are all kind of connected to the same body of learning. Um, I don't know if that's total wank or not. No, no, I think that's exactly, me. that's exactly true. And the, I think the thing is, I, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure you couldn't achieve that with a Star Wars game. Obviously, you're right that you, you can't go at it tabula rasa. But I mean, a lot of the places that, um, uh, <laughs> whatever the main character's name is, is exploring. Cal Kestis. Cal Kestis. I got the Cal part. But, um, you know, the places he's exploring are unknown to him, Um even if the larger world is known. And I feel like you could do more of the stuff. I, th I think the problem is that is I like I, I in Dark Souls is a good comparison because not only do I remember individual inventory items I picked up in that game, but I remember exactly where they were, how difficult it was to get to them and what they meant in the larger context. Because those, instead of just being like, uh, you know, a, a different colored poncho, they are an item which changes the way you play could possibly be uh, you know a major boon in, in increasing your stats in certain regards they come with a story which explains something about the wider world and their placement is not only the the end of some sort of puzzle often but their placement also describes how they got to be there or raises the question of how they got to be there all of this stuff feeds back and connects mm. and reinforces itself uh, you know, you're you're enhancing your ability by finding these things. You're answering questions about the universe, and you're asking new ones. And none of that happens when it's just different colored lightsaber grip in a box. And yeah. I think that means that there's you don't remember anything about how you got there or, or why you did it um, because they are just divorced from those things. And I remember, I, I think there was, you did raise an interesting argument in the defense of that the last time we spoke about this, because you, you were saying that the the fact that it didn't induce like agonizing FOMO in you was a real relief. <laughs> yeah, I love the absence of pain. <laughs> yeah. Huge but, fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I do wonder if if they've gone too far in the other direction by by saying we won't want to inflict FOMO on players. They've basically made it immemorable <laughs> in certain regards <laughs> yeah i mean i will say this like I, I i remember enjoying it i think i have no memory of recording that podcast possibly because of the the, the liquid element but like um but yeah like i am also sort of like vaguely looking forward to the new one with no one no idea when i'll when i'll actually play it so you know i think I do, I do still encounter the feeling of like, it's a relief when it's a game I can finish. You know what I mean? There is oh, that yeah. element of like, oh, I love that there isn't too much to this, you know? Yeah. But that's not, that's a, I think that's, um, that is a response to a broader lack of time or attention, mm. not it's a quality that I would like want all games to have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm comparing it to something like I mean, obviously the from software is a good comparison, but I think honestly, probably enduringly like I was trying to think about like what, what else was I playing around that time? Uh, and it's like I remember a lot of Sekiro. 
Mm. And Sekiro, I think, makes a, it's quite a valid comparison in a lot of ways, right? Like, it's also a kind of from software structure, but with more of an action game on top and so on. And, like, you know, there are many, I have very, very many vivid things come to mind when I think of Sekiro, including, like, boss mechanics and moments and stuff. And I don't remember everything, but I loved that game. And um, I, I rinsed Fallen Order, but I genuinely actually don't remember very much, apart from, like, the ending and, like... Um, other bits and bobs so you are right that it hasn't stuck around but i'd be interested to see if the new one changes that it might mm. not need to honestly um well that's look- the thing i mean it's a perfectly uh valid uh commerce to make games that are i mean they're not making uh stuff to outlive people and echo down the centuries are they they're making products which they have to hit a certain threshold to make bank and that's it to some degree. With that in mind, that so what you, you mentioned that you were looking forward to the new one. Is there a particular mm-hmm. given uh, given that you were a little colder on Fallen Order originally? Why? What do you think prompted that curiosity in the new one? I really don't remember. I don't know. I have no idea why. <laughs> I don't even remember why you're looking forward. To it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I suppose one of the reasons that I've gone back to it is that they. I, I saw a headline somewhere which said that the new game begins with you as a fully empowered. Jedi without removing any of the abilities that you learned in the previous game. Um, so I figured I should probably go back and replay the previous game so that I can come to the new one without being, you know, lost. But yeah, I don't really, I don't really know why. I mean, I, I, I know now having replayed it that I, I am invested enough in the characters and also the the action of play is very satisfying. Like the the combination of powers, the combat in the game, I think is really nicely designed and rewarding. Uh, so for that reason, I will play the next one as well. The larger interest that I have in it, I have no idea in what in what that is rooted. Really. <laughs> Fascinating. Fascinating. <laughs> quite, quite a big run of like um, AAA games in the next couple of months, really. Like mm. it does feel like the kind of whatever that, I don't know if that even has been a drought, really. Maybe I felt mm. it, but like it's some what? sort of combination of like this into Spider-Man, Diablo, Street Fighter, etc. Right, all the games that presumably were delayed because of COVID. Yeah, right. They're all they're all going to come out in the next year and a half, two years, and that, that's it's going to be an interesting time. Yeah, because Fallen Order was twenty nineteen, right? That's probably the other reason I don't remember it. Mm, yes, maybe. I don't know. It sounded Sounds like right. we were in person because we were obviously sharing rum. So I, must, I, I don't know whether that dates it. Yeah, presumably before uh, before the year in which we were. Mm. Um, incarcerated anyway maybe uh, if it comes to steam uh which it might do the sequel i mean uh, i might be able to tell you how it fares next week well the week after who knows maybe mm. yeah that'd be exciting <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry that means sounds non-committal as it was <laughs> sorry that was <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think i've already forgotten what it was we were talking about i don't know I don't know. <sighs> well, speaking of, uh, what was I? Am I? <laughs> What's going on? Should we stop? Yeah, that's probably wise, isn't it? Well, we will. We will find out certainly if the game uh, does come to Steam. That's probably the information that could be found. <laughs> to be honest. Um, we will find out if you played it and what you thought about it. Perhaps in the future. Who knows, based on our recent track record with getting pods out when we say we're going to get them out, anything is possible. The full gamut of possibilities from yes all the way to no. Um, (laughs) But in the meantime, this is or has been all of the pod that we've done. And that's it. Um, If you'd like... like to find more podcasts like this one and better, you can find them on crateandcrowbar.com. You can also find them on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Crate and Crowbar. Find the podcast on Twitter at Crate and Crowbar. Uh, and uh, you'll find a link to our Discord community on our website. Uh, that's to repeat, crateandcrowbar.com. If you wish to find us individually, I'm on Twitter at C Thurston. We don't usually do this anymore, but I guess I do use it to plug books now, so I'll just say it. Uh, C-T-H-U-R-S-T-E-N. Uh, Marsh. Yeah. Yep, indeed. Uh, teeth. You got them. I got them. You can have them too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, it's a book I made. You can back it on Kickstarter if you want, but you don't have to. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's plugged himself to sleep. That's it. Is that everything we normally say? I forgot. Oh, no, I forgot something important. Thank you, as ever, to our Patreon supporters um, who fund all of these podcasts we actually do and don't fund the ones we don't. Crucially, crucially. Thank you sincerely from us uh, for, for your continued support. I think that's it, isn't it? I'm going so. to go now and think about what I've done. <laughs> Good night, Chris. Good night, Marsh.